Welcome to another edition of Pause for Thought with me, Greg. Here's one of my latest sermons, Zeal for the House of the Lord Consumes Me. Enjoy. John chapter 2, beginning at verse 13, Jesus clears the temple courts. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do this? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he spoke of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you. And the young people go with Janet. Please be seated. Yes, Alex, you're still young. <laughs> let's bow our heads to pray may I speak in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit and bring glory to you alone Amen Christianity is a religion of rules and regulations that's what people say and they quote the Ten Commandments that we're supposed to follow it's don't do this don't do that don't do the other but actually what they have forgotten is it is about a relationship with God through Jesus it's what's in the heart that matters in this 21st century we have a pick and mix Woolworth way of thinking we take the bits we like and we chuck out the bits we don't like and change the bits we don't like. It's very interesting with the Ten Commandments because it seems clear to us that we shouldn't have idolatry, that we shouldn't murder, shouldn't lie, shouldn't steal, shouldn't commit adultery and all these things which are fair. But Jesus said to fulfill all these, love God and your neighbour as yourself. And if you do that, you fulfill the rest. Because you're not going to steal from them, you're not going to lie to them, you're not going to commit adultery with their wife. But people want to change these things. Our nation, the United Kingdom, has been built on the Ten Commandments. All our laws, all that we follow. This is probably one of the reasons why we've had a bit of a conflict with the European Union in that since 1066 with the Magna Carta you are innocent until proven guilty on the continent you are guilty and have to prove you're innocent and it's a really important distinction between the two and so there's a tension between two visions and philosophies I have many Roman Catholic friends who I love dearly but you can't get round that you shall not have an idol and bow down to it. It's also interesting that in the last six months major events have happened around the world. So for example the huge statue of Christ in Brazil has been hit by lightning three or four times one the thumb blew off 
and the other times it hits Jesus' head. Then there is, in the continent, there is a bronze statue of Jesus under the water, and the lightning has hit that several times. Other statues of the Virgin Mary around the world have been uh, broken, destroyed, heads cut off, lightning hitting them. Because God is not mocked. We don't have a graven image. And you think, well, how do people who have these things get away with it? No, it's like there's been a struggle because people think of Christianity as a cross with Jesus on the cross, don't they? But he's alive. Why is he on the cross? He's not dead. And that's because of a philosophy and a way of looking at things that's very different between those who are Protestant and those who are Roman Catholic. Because if you think we, we call this Holy Communion, some churches call it the Eucharist, which means Thanksgiving, and other people call it the Last Supper. Roman Catholics call it the Mass. That's because the priests say, may this sacrifice made at your hands and mine be acceptable in your sight. And so they believe that they're re-sacrificing Jesus over and over every time they celebrate the Mass. But the Bible's clear that he sacrificed his life once and for all. So how do they get away with it? Because they've taken that commandment out of their Bible. And split another one into two to fill the gap. Because the Pope is seen as the vicar of Christ. And vicar means standing in the place of. So I'm a vicar. I have a license to stand in the place of the bishop who can't be everywhere. He's the vicar of Christ. So he is standing there as Christ for the church. So he can change God's word. No. God's word's God's word. And when you think about loving God and loving your neighbour as yourself, I said this at, at school in the academy, I said, well, you know, you feed yourself, you clothe yourself, and then I looked around and I thought, well, most of you wash yourselves. <laughs> there are one or two honky ones there. You know, if, if you look after other people as you look after yourself, and I know there are some people who have a, a wrong self-image, then that's love because you're not going to do all those things which the Ten Commandments says you're not supposed to do. So if we go to the second reading from 1 Corinthians, it talks about how the cross is foolishness. Because God has proven that the philosophies and thoughts of humankind are foolishness. When you, we look at the Bible, we try to interpret it in a way that we can understand. But what we've forgotten is that the Bible was written from a Jewish perspective. We have a Greek mindset. So, we see a problem, we analyse it. And we try to work it out. Whereas the Jews have a completely different way of thinking about it. Thinking that from Jerusalem, you know, God's capital, what's the implications of it? Who's going to be affected by it? So it's a completely different way of looking at scripture. So the, the Lord has used something to show that the world's thinking is flawed. Because how can somebody willingly go into a cross to die make a difference? We just say, silly man. 
You know, when Jesus was on the cross and it, at midday till three o'clock it went black. That was because God couldn't look at the sin that Jesus was taking on himself for us. Because he's a holy God. And I'm convinced that Satan would have tormented him on the cross and saying, look, you're giving up your life. You can click, well, he couldn't click his fingers because he was, anyway, won't go there. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're God, you can call down the angels and sort it all out and destroy all the bad and keep all the good. And look, this is what they're going to do. They're going to deny your name. They're going to have the Inquisition and say it's in the name of Jesus. They're going to start wars. They're going to malign you. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. It's not worth it. But Jesus decided that even though we're a shower and we don't deserve it, he loves us deeply and still said yes. Then he goes on, where are the wise? Where is the teacher of the law? The religious people. And after all, it's the religious people who crucified Jesus. Where's the philosophers of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? You can't work out things always logically. Because Jesus dying on the cross was not logical. What was logical was that he raised up an army and kicked the, the, the Romans out. From a worldly perspective. And that's what the Jews were expecting. For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not recognize him. So these clever people who had had thousands of years of scripture which pointed towards the coming of the Messiah had interpreted in a way they wanted rather than in the way it is. And if you think of Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant you know, and how he was crucified and whipped and all the rest of it, it's clear, but what have they done? They've made that chapter forbidden. Because it doesn't fit in their way of thinking. Sounds like politics, doesn't it? Jews demand signs. Okay, if you're God. Show, show us a sign to prove that you have the right to do this. Greeks look for wisdom. Oh, you know, I can work it out in my own strength. I'll just debate you. You know, and that's your truth. I have my truth. How do we know what truth is? By seeing if it matches up with God's word. Because when you think about it, why did God give the Ten Commandments in the first place? He gave it so that Israel could found a nation with a legal structure and a way of living because all of us flourish if we know what our parameters are and what is right and what is not right if there isn't any structure anything goes and we see what's happening in the world when anything goes God has called both Jews and Greeks, that's us, Greeks, Christ, the power of God and wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And that's why it says the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing because they have chosen to turn their back on it because they can't understand it because we're talking about something that is spiritual not academic and that's why the Holy Spirit has been sent by the Lord so that we can have wisdom and knowledge and discernment and understanding because it's a heart thing not a head thing I remember <laughs> 
and where the one in myth is on, but uh, there we go. When I was a lay preacher, lay reader at Liverpool Cathedral uh, in 1979, I, I was allowed to preach once a year in the cathedral, and I also worked in a church in Chinatown in Liverpool. And it was my turn to preach, and I remember using <laughs> an analogy. I was young. And I was saying that most clergy are bald because they're knocking down the thoughts from their heads into their hearts. <laughs> and unfortunately, the second in command of the cathedral was uh, totally bald, not bald, and he didn't forgive me. So, how to win friends and influence people. But in our gospel, we have Jesus cleansing the temple. He goes into the temple and he sees that basically it's a marketplace. They're more interested in selling the things for sacrifice than they are about the worship and praise of God. And also it was well known, it was well known that the money changers used to rip you off. So you'd have your Roman money and you couldn't buy anything in the temple unless you had the temple's money. So they would convert the money and they'd charge you whatever they liked and they'd rip you off. That's why, you know, when we had that picture of the, the widow's mite going into the collection about she'd given everything. And so because of that injustice, and using God's name in that way to rip people off, that's why he was so upset. Are we that upset? No. Recently they've had a rave in Canterbury Cathedral with a full bar, with them dancing around and drinking whatever they were drinking. Alcohol, definitely. Just to raise money for the cathedral. Let it fall down. It's wickedness. It's wrong. It's going like that into the Lord. You know, what is it all about? What sort of God do you believe in? Do you believe in God? It's also very interesting that... Uh, Many of these people who are leaders in this situation will say, God, 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 God. They won't say Jesus. That says something. Because a walking carrot can be your God. Or is that just Aldi? No, a, fr a friend of mine is God is money. And he will walk over anyone to get more. And the more he has, the more he's dissatisfied and wants more. So you can have idolatry of sex, and you can have idolatry of money, you can have idolatry of anything. Possessions, thrill-seeking and going on all these holidays where you, you, know, you jump off a mountain or whatever you, you're going to do. Just to have a thrill. So it's broader than just plaster statues or carvings of something so all these things are talking about a matter of the heart the Bible says you can tell somebody who is a true believer and follower of Jesus not by what they say but what they do and how they live their lives do they add up I've said this before. When people know you come here, they watch you. They listen to you. And if it's on Facebook, they slag you off. They tell lies. <clears throat> Why? Because they want us to fail. Because if we fail, it makes them look better. And they don't have to make a commitment. 
Because Jesus wants us to change. To be a blessing. He wants us to shine with the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness. Because the gospel is contrary to the wisdom of the world. It's a different way of living and believing. It's a different way where other people are seen as better than ourselves. And we're called to be servants and love them. And forgive those who hate us. Some of the greatest testimonies have been from people who originally were the greatest hater. Think of St. Paul who, who was originally Saul. And he was a Pharisee who was going through Israel and on his way to Damascus, arresting and having imprisoned and having Christians killed because they were against the Jewish faith. And he met Jesus on the Damascus road. And he became the greatest evangelist and apostle, reaching out to us, the non-Jews, that has ever been. That's why scripture says it's by the blood of the lamb, by the foolishness of the cross, Jesus deciding to lay down his life because of love and the word of our testimony that we are saved. You know, you, you know my testimony that I was a uh, section head waiter on a cruise ship and just one or two people don't know this with P&O. Went around the world twice and got to a stage with depression and problems with the head waiter and all this sort of stuff that I got drunk. We were come, I just, I, the thing is, they didn't like it that I was the only person in the purses department, so that's the catering bit, uh, that had a steering ticket. So I'd steered the 42,000 ton ship for 36 hours. And also I had a lifeboat ticket because when you go, <laughs> when you go, go on, on a, uh, the Merchant Navy, they give you this card and it says, this is what happens and what you're supposed to do if the ship's going to sink. It's going to be seven blasts on the funnel with a gap in between and that's abandoned ship. And then it says, based on the rules of HMS, or is it? Yeah, MV Birkenhead, coxswains, women, children, male passengers, crew. And I thought, hmm. So I trained to be a coxswain. <laughs> and I was the only one in the persons department and people used to resent that I, I had that. Anyway, I'd just taken my uh, ticket and passed it. And uh, basically what it does is it means you command a lifeboat. And a particularly difficult service as we're coming out of Auckland Harbour in New Zealand. And we went into a massive storm. And I mean a massive storm. One where you lock the punkers, which, which are the covers over the, the windows, and you bolt them down. You put edges around the tables so the crockery doesn't fall off. You put sick bags everywhere. Um, and we went into a Force 11, and it only goes to 12. Uh, and I decided that I was going to jump off the back of the ship and commit suicide. And as I was there, it was a bit of a scary thing seeing the, the waves up here. And when a, ship, <laughs> when a ship's in a storm, it doesn't go bob, 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 up and down like that. It goes down and up, round and then down and up and round. So it was quite a, a puke-inducing moment. And I cried out to the Lord, if you're there, if you care, help me. And in the midst of this massive noise and turmoil and everything, it was like I was in a bubble of complete peace. 
and I decided not to go ahead with it, went back to my cabin, slept, and then from that moment started the process of leaving the ship, um, and I took the first job that I could, which was a, a hotel assistant manager in Liverpool, a bit of a come down, because I was used to working in five-star hotels, and this was a three-star, but I was just determined, uh, and that was the beginning of the change of my life. You no, know, so by it's the blood of the Lamb and the word of a test. So that's why I'm here. I'm here because I know that what Jesus did on the cross changes lives. <clears throat> it's not just an academic theory. I remember when I was at theological college, you know, I was so excited. And they tried to knock it out of me. Saying, oh, you've got to know this uh, uh, theologian, you've got to know that. And I'm saying, well, he's talking rubbish. <laughs> you know, it, but, but, but the Lord helped me to persevere. And even though the enemy has tried to take me out several times, that my testimony is, here I am. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You know, and somebody asked me, yes, no, the day before yesterday, would you change anything? No. Not a thing. Because it's made me who I am today. Going through all the struggles and all the pains and all the challenges builds backbone. Resilience. And it just reinforces, I know that I know that I know that I know. And there's nothing that can change that. And that nothing will. And I'm here to share that with you so that you will experience the presence of Jesus in your heart as much as I have. Amen. So, so, until next time, it's about God bless you from me, Greg. Bye.